with Avatar of Zia mere days away, it's time as sorcerers got ready to play. Hello, my fellow choosers of the best class. Who's excited to immediately smash tier 25 even though the devs said it would be impossible for, well, anyone? Hell, they said it would be impossible for even Ball Lightning. To that I say nay! For there shall be nothing we cannot conquer in Season 2. And, well, I'm here to show you exactly what to do. Let's slip into something a little bit more comfortable as we head towards the event. That being the perfect, maximum tanky, yet still devastatingly deleting damage output, Abattoir of Zer counter build. Especially now we've actually seen a ball lightning sorcerer attempt a tier 1 and a tier 10, it's been very interesting. It's certainly not a great ball lightning build that they used, but it's not a bad one either, and I was always planning to have this really still have all the damage we can get while being tanky, because I think it's easy to assume we'll need to be tankier than we might actually need to be, and that does seem to be the case. So going too far towards immortality is a little bit wasted, because we really are going to need to squeeze every little bit of damage we can get to really take down those higher tiers. And that's exactly what I have done here. Though that said, uh, we know now that we do only have one life, one death, and it's over. And the final trio of Bloodseekers that spawns are really quite potent, even in Tier 1. So we really do need to make sure we can handle the hits. And we need to be able to move quickly through the dungeon. We are going to get perfectly unkillable while still being able to output, well the best, highest DPS literally in the game. And that is a perfect union of power. So, how exactly are we going to do it? Well, I've got two versions for you. I've got Light Tank for the early ranks where we can still afford to be a little bit more reckless for damage. And then we've got Full Heavy Tank that is going to keep you standing no matter what the higher difficulties throw at you. I will present Heavy Tank to begin with and we'll do the modifications for Light later on. And seriously, you're not ready for just how hard to put down you will be. So, without further ado then, let's find out how to turn Ball Lightning not just into an unstoppable killing machine, but to an unstoppable can't be killed machine. As you are seeing with me so contemptuously easily walking through this tier 100, never taking damage at any point from anything. I mean, you've just been seeing my health sort of casually full, or nearly full the entire time, and it's actually really satisfying to be this relaxed, even in something like a tier 100. It gives you a lot less to think about when even things like Stormbane's Raft or Drifting Shade or even the Lightning Storm can't kill you. Not even close. Elites that explode when they die from their own enchantments or raffixes can't kill you or even threaten you really. You could stand in blood blisters all day. Honestly, it's a little bit scary how perhaps complacent this might make you, so try not to lose your edge when you become this hard to kill. In any case, let's do this. Here we are then on our journey to immortality. Beginning with two points in to Firebolt, it becomes our first enchantment slot, and this time around, it is much more importantly here to make us take less damage from burning enemies than it is to make us hurt burning enemies more, though that is always welcome. Over then to our now unlocked cause, where we grab the one in Devastation to mainly get to Dominant, for the 9% multiplicative, and then we take Chain Lightning down to Enhanced and then Destructive for more crackling energy everywhere, so more mana everywhere, and it becomes our second enchantment slot. Now, you can do the Frozen Orb version, you can do the Lightning Spear version. Essentially, choose which one you prefer, but I do think that the harder Abattoir of Zia gets, the higher up the tiers you go, the more it will 
end up favoring uh, the extra mana that comes from Chain Lightning, as we will need more Ball Lightnings to kill enemies. And beyond that, given we're in a situation where you only get one life, supposedly before it's game over, Chain Lightning being swapped for Flame Shield to give us two lives is the least build damaging swap, whereas swapping Lightning Spear and Frozen Orb requires you to shift other things around instead of just swapping the enchantment and taking the points out of Chain Lightning and respending them. So, with that in mind, I have decided to go for the classic Chain Lightning Static Surge Legendary Node combo, and we'll get into that in a bit. In any case, there we have it. Grab Charged Bolts and go down to Destructive. Remember, what I'm presenting now is the Ultra Tank. We will go over the Light Tank shortly, but in this form, we will be having loads of unstable currents uptime, which means we'll be firing out random charged bolts all the time, and 25% less damage dealt by everything that gets hit by them is going to be a big deal. Over to your defensives, where we get Flame Shield, and this time we do spend the points to get the movement speed, but mainly the heal when we press it, as that'll come in handy. Teleport for the massive mobility and clear speed, which is very extra important in Abattoir, but the DR also is key. We don't get Class Cannon, of course we're trying to be tanky, so making ourselves take multiplicative more damage, even if we can kind of get by with it, yeah, it's just not worth it, and we can spend extra points elsewhere without this, like, for example, the three to make charged bolts destructive. Then we get elemental attunement, so we can reset our defensives and move on to conjuration. We grab ice blades as our source of cold damage for Tal Rush's stacks, and then we get lightning spear. Take it to invoked, as this turns it into a monstrous defensive ability, giving you a shield when you press it, thanks to protection, but more importantly, stunning every enemy in the room, and then this also makes the lightning spears summoned by your unstable currents do the same thing, and it's very, very effective for just staying alive. And then we also get Conjuration Mastery for stacking multiplicative more damage when our Conjurations are up, and with all the extra lightning spears from unstable currents, this can get quite high quite fast, and it's free damage. Then, the usual double defensives of just take 21% less damage and get constant barriers from every button we press cannot be ignored in, essentially, any Sorcerer build. Over to Mastery, where we get Inner Flames and then into Devouring Blaze to power up our crits thanks to our Firebolt Burning Synergy, and then fill up your Ball Lightning as not just the star of this show, but let's be honest, the star of Season 2. Take it to Enhanced for even more tick rate, and and then make it that crackling energy summoning engine. Which, of course, is very necessary because of Invigorating Conduit. It makes you just have endless mana. This, uh, coupled with the constant chain lightnings going out summoning their own, just fills the floor with so much crackling energy that very quickly the only place the game can spawn it is on top of you as the only empty space, which means you gain mana without even picking it up. So that's quite fun. Then to our ultimate, so we get unstable currents as it is essentially, well, god mode. We do a lot more damage when it's on, yes, but we become near impossible to kill as every lightning spear, as I said, cast with unstable currents gives you a barrier. Then we get prime to get that sweet attack speed, but we don't need supreme because we don't need the crackling energy to pulse faster because our key passive is not overflowing energy. We will, of course, be taking Via's mastery for the 20% less damage done to us, and because it lets us use the Mage Lord aspect, which we will get to. Now, the extra damage done from this, the 15% increase, doesn't seem to actually be working, which is a shame, but we still want this for the pure damage reduction it provides, because it's our single greatest source of it, coupled with the aspect. Then we get the final couple passives, causing currents to get to electrocution, 15% less damage dealt to us is great, and then uh, conduction. The 9% movement speed is clear the place faster, and we're on a time limit in Abattoir of Zer, but also it translates to more attack speed via Ravenous. 
goodness. So that is your skill tree, all neat and tidy and ready for business. Straight into gear then, starting with aspects on your dagger, and do make sure it is a dagger for the extra damage to close enemies. We have no need for lucky hit in ball lightning. You want accelerating. The extra attack speed constantly up thanks to the chain lightnings being thrown out from our enchantment helps a lot, and very definitively it helps. If you didn't know, you are able aiming to get 100% attack speed. That is because that is the key secret number to power this passive up as much as it can be powered up. So you get a good 10% at least from your gloves, you get a good 25% from accelerating, that is 35%. You get a good amount from your ravenous, i.e. another 60%, and then we're almost at that 100. You get a little bit of extra while fighting, and suddenly we do comfortably sit at that glorious, yes, 100% attack speed. In any case, over to your focus, where I've got conceited, and this is just nice. We constantly have barriers up, and it's a big increase while we have barriers up. Elementalist, 40% more crit chance, uh, takes us to almost nearly 100% crit chance, which is really, really good, and... And it makes ball lightning ever that much more deadly, as we're always above 100 mana with the sea of crackling energy. On your gloves, you have that all-important gravitational to make it rotate and, you know, make the build function and do more damage too, because why not? Over to your amulet, where you are going to need to have disobedience. This is usually where we put it anyway, but in abattoir, yeah, that extra armor is going to come in massively handy handy and likely just be mandatory, so get as good a disobedience as you can on your necklace. On your helmet then, we have that Mage Lord's Aspect. This gives you an extra 27% damage reduction. And this applies to everything, it's just per close enemy. So if you've got this maxed out and a skeleton crossbow fires at you, you will take 27% less damage to it, which is so, so much a relief I cannot express. This is one of the single best defensive aspects full stop, and we're very lucky to actually be able to use it. Then on your chest, we have Ever Living. Everything will always be vulnerable, thanks to a cursed touch and prey on the weak, so uh, it dealing up to 25% less damage is a big, big help. Then we have our uniques, Tal Rashes for that massive stacking multiplicative increase and those perfect sweet affixes, a mandatory feature in essentially every sorcerer build likely from now until the end of time. Then we move on to Tibalt's Will, the extra damage is glorious, we keep this up constantly with Flame Shield and Teleport and the burst of mana is almost as good, it gives us so much more ball lightningage and the damage reduction from close means we're not losing as much as we normally would by not using a pair of defensive legs. Then, this time around, we are back to Flicker Step. While the damage increase of Ursu's Heirloom is great, we want something a little bit more healthy focused. The extra damage reduction from close is great, but more importantly, the high unstable currents uptime is everything. It lets us kill things faster and from range with all of the shock skills flying out and gives us a permanent barrier while it's active. Permanent stable currents is the way forward in Abattoir, so yes, get yourself a good pair of flicker steps. And that is that. In your gem slots, you want crit damage to vulnerable, you want health in your armor, and then armor in your jewelry. We have naturally 70% all resist from just being intelligence and our paragon board, so we are okay on there. This will say 70% when I get a certain paragon glyph to level 21, so it's accounted for. So, affixes that you want on your gear then. Ranks of Devouring Blade, and mastery skills. You want critical strike chance, you want critical strike damage, you want resource generation and mana cost reduction. Then you want attack speed, and then you want your general damage increases like damage to close, vulnerable damage, intelligence, and so on and so forth. 
For defensive aspects, you want to make sure to get percent total armor on your helmet, and it's also pretty good on your chest. You want to make sure you have damage reduction from at least two different sources on your chest. I've got distant and burning here, and uh, then you also want to get some maximum life on one of the two. Getting intelligence on both is really nice, just all round, both for resistances and doing a little bit more damage, and the extra mana on your helmet is is very good too. The general rule of thumb for ball lightning is have enough resource to cast two ball lightnings without going under 100 mana, and that's what we have achieved here. But make sure that these two pieces have at least six out of eight defensive aspects. Five out of eight like I have is still fine, but that's the sort of goal you're going for. Then we talk vampiric powers. You want to have infection for the fourth stack of Tal Rashes, that's too much damage to ignore. A cursed touch, so everyone is vampiric cursed, and because everyone is vampiric cursed, they are now vulnerable, taking more damage, doing less damage to us, and it just really powers a lot, does this classic important duo. Ravenous, to both cast ball lightnings faster and have them tick faster, it cannot be ignored, but now, our fifth vampiric power is going to be Sanguine Brace. This will fortify us very quickly, 6% per enemy we kill and we shred them, keeps us fortified for near 90% plus of our time, and the 8% permanent crit chance is really good, but being fortified is another big chunk of damage reduction just for being fortified, even though we don't have any fortify synergy, it is worth it. You can, if you prefer, instead use Resilience, but definitely pick one of the two. I prefer Sanguine Brace because of the offensive edge while still keeping us alive, but you can make that choice. So, before we go into Paragon then, which is the same for any version of this, let me show you what you want to swap for the lighter tank version. This version you want to start with in Abattoir, and then essentially go as far as you can before needing to swap to a more defensive style as you go through the tiers. So, first and foremost, you want to put Raiment of the Infinite on to group enemies, kill them faster, beat the timer, and progress. This will be very, very good, at least in the early stages, where we can actually use it without dying. That's the only real gear swap. Technically, you could put Esus on, but honestly, the Flicker Step is still more than fine. And if the boss spawns, then if you can really want to min-max, whack Godslayer Crown on real quick, as we'll be fine against a one on one with a boss, but again, not needed. The only real gear change is raiment. The rest of the light tankiness part comes from changing your skill tree, where you're going to want to do the following. Take the three points out of destructive charged bolts, and then we're going to move them into glass cannon. Ta-da! I know, that was, uh, that was a very, very difficult swap over, but yeah, essentially, Raiment with uh, all of the glass cannon is uh, the light version, and then take all the glass cannon out and swap Raiment for an actual defensive chest is the heavy version. Though, if you want to take it a little bit further, still be tanky, but have even more of a faster-paced mob-clearing edge, what you want to do is take the points out of conduction, get Supreme Currents back, get rid of Veer's Mastery, put on Overflowing Energy to lower the cooldown on Stable and teleport even more, and then we can spend our final two points in Devastation. That's the other way to go if you want to push it a little bit more offensively inclined, and obviously at that point swap your Mage Lord's Helmet for a different aspect. I, however, will leave it in uh, the uh, tanky tank tank mode, so we can and move on to Paragon Ball. That said, I do want to spend a moment with how to actually play this, though I feel like that is perhaps unnecessary, it's ball lightning after all, but hey, I never want to have an incomplete build guide. The usual, just spam your ball lightning, make sure you uh, teleport to both progress faster, and uh, to generate mana with Tibalts, make sure you're moving around constantly, both uh, with your dash and just walking, dash through your enemies to uh, flicker step, to uh, get your ultimate off cooldown faster, and you can see how quickly it does come back, even without anticipation as a vampiric power, it's not actually fit 
finished and we've already got it back. Use uh, your Ice Blades on cooldown, Flame Shield as you need to for survivability, Lightning Spear as you need to for survivability, and you are good to go. One final little tip then is when it comes to using Tibalt's Will for mana. You get 50 primary resource when you become unstoppable, but the key there is become unstoppable. So, uh, flame shield counts, but you're in flame shield for two seconds. If you teleport during those two seconds, you don't actually get the mana. For example, if I completely empty my mana pool, flame shield teleport, you see how I didn't get two bursts of mana. So that's something to think about as a little bit of more tech. It's not super relevant because it is only two seconds and you don't often teleport just after flame shielding, but it is technically a thing you can pay attention to. Now that we've gone over that then, let's actually look at the defensives that we're working with. Full 70% all resist, which will be true 70% when my elementalist glyph is level 21, and then uh, the defensives in question. A nice chunk of just all damage reduction on the amulet, which is certainly something that's worthwhile a good amount of armor that with our disobedience actually fully active, we go up to just shy 15k, which is the sweet spot we're going to want to be at for high abattoir rank, so that works nicely. Then we get ourselves a good chunk of reduction from elites, from vulnerable, from close, from distance, from burning, and while we have a barrier. That comes from one of our glyphs. Now, what you want is as many any different damage reductions as possible, because having more of one is less effective, so the mixture leads to the tankiest you can be. So this mixture is very nice. The extra 30% from burning is more than super worth getting your Firebolt enchant involved if you've not been using it until now in Ball Lightning. So with that, all done, let's talk Paragon Board. I am rather proud of this one. Stay with me point for point, and here we go. Up and left to grab Resilience, the All Resist and the Health, and then we go right through the Non-Physical, up here through the Intelligence, grabbing both this Intelligence and the All Resist, and then over to the Glyph, where Elementalist is. Again, once this is level 21, that will give us the full 570% Resist. Go up to this all resist here and then we go up left through this willpower to our first board which is as usual the enchantment master board the lovely core of any worthwhile sorcerer build heading straight right initially to grab elemental balance I wish I had enough points to just grab little things like this but I've really had to be ruthless with this to get to what I've gotten initially then go right to get the glyph slot this is where reinforced goes for that 15% DI with a barrier, as we always have a barrier, you do feel this, and then up uh, through the willpower in order to activate it, and grab Erudite and a little bit more willpower to activate it, as is down here, and then we can head off right to the next board. Going left from the glyph, and then up, splitting off to grab both non-physical damage rare nodes, and then we are done here. Over to this, which is our Burning Instinct board, and we have a lot more here than usual. Going right, and this specific setup that I've got gives us as much dexterity as possible without wasting any points, so try and match this look in this orientation. Going down and left for more damage to burning, but mainly to get cinders. Then we go down a little bit more, hop to the glyph, this is where destruction goes, which is why we want all of that dexterity we can get. Then going straight down here for damage reduction from burning, and even more of it from smoldering embers, more DR from burning, and then heading right and down to the next board. For now, though, we also want to go right from here up to the middle, where we grab Kindling for more damage to elites and burning enemies, and then we want to head up, immediately go right, and you can end up over here for more damage reduction from burning enemies. Then we're going to go back to this dexterity node, north of Kindling, head up, veer off left to get reduced damage from elite, and the extra 100 armor from Safeguard, and then down here for more reduced damage from Elites. This makes a surprising amount of difference. Then we can head all the way up here to get our next board. But for now, we are going to exit south and go in 
according to our frigid fate, vulnerable board. Have it in this orientation, so oppressive is in the top right corner, and then immediately head towards it. We're just going to go straight through it, through the more vulnerable damage nodes, and then immediately down to this dexterity. Here we can split right to get to our final board, but for now, go left and go straight through the glyph slot, and this is Flame Feeder, the more damage to burning, and one of the big reasons to use the Firebolt Glyph. Continuing straight through to reach the extra dexterity needed to activate it and power it up, and then we go straight down from it through weakness and all the way round to grab Frigid Fate for 23% more multiplicative damage to vulnerable enemies, which is every enemy all of the time, so yeah, nice increase. Then we are done here for now, we want to put our next board up north on exiting Burning Instinct. This is going to be your Static Surge board. Initially, you want to orientate it so the extra mana paralyzing node is at the bottom right, and that's what we're initially going to go straight for to get the extra mana, which is very helpful. Remember, be able to cast two ball lightnings without going below 100 mana. The extra damage to stunned is also very nice if we are playing with Raymond and the lightning spears will stun everyone as well, so you get value out of this no matter what. Then we head straight up via left and go straight for the legendary node. The extra vulnerable uptime is nice, it's not important. The 10% mana regen is, however. This results in quite a nice amount of mana flowing in on top of your crackling energy. Then we head right, going straight up via left to get the 10 intelligence from Electro, straight back up to get Adept, and I love that we go through four intelligence here on the way. It's such a clean Paragon board, and activate it for bigger ball lightnings and harder hitting ones, finishing it off by going to incapacitate for more damage to stunned and the 10 intelligence. Then we are going to end things off with that final board on the right of Frigid Fate here, and this is going to be your Ceaseless Conduit board. We want to orientate it like this, so the glyph slot is in the bottom left, very close to the gate, and head straight towards it, specifically through the double dexterity here, and this is territorial. The less damage from close is key, and the extra damage too close is also quite nice. Heading over to the left to get 10% more lightning damage, why not? but mainly to get the other two big dexterities to both activate and power up the damage to close enemies. So that is your Paragon board. Still uh, tons of damage from it, but now also tons of damage reduction from it, and it works rather well. I honestly do think this is one of the most elegant boards that I've ever put together, and I'm really quite pleased with it. Then the final note really is once you get the Blood Glyph, I would certainly certainly think about putting it in the Frigid Fate, as this has the most amount of intelligence that you can grab to power it up, and then I would swap Flame Feeder over to Territorial and just accept we're losing the DR from Territorial, as it might end up being overkill. That said, I will be bringing you a proper post-abattoir best ball lightning build of everything I've learnt in it and the glyph, and essentially look forward to that. So, that is everything then. How to play Ball Lightning with all of the power we're accustomed with, but with a hell load more tankiness to keep ourselves alive in a mode where we really cannot afford to die, or it's just game over. I hope this is helpful for you as we head into it and makes all the difference. I really love making these for you guys, and I really appreciate how much you seem to enjoy them too, so honestly, thank you for giving them the listens that you do. Like you've enjoyed this, subscribe and hit the bell for more, consider supporting the future of the channel on Patreon down below, and until we meet again, a good bye. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos, dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes, bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice, to reiterate that it is nice, to look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage is... Uh, goodbye.